Hi, I'm Rabbi Stuart Weinblatt, and I want to welcome you to today's conversation with Ambassador Dory Gold. Our call today is sponsored by the Zionist Rabbinic Coalition, a grassroots coalition of rabbis from all denominations across all geographic areas of North America who are commit and Israel who are committed to promoting Jewish unity and peoplehood. We invite you to go to our website, which is www.zionistrabbis.org, in order to read our mission statement, uh, to learn more about the, co uh, about the coalition, to sign up for other calls, and most important of all, we welcome you to join. Our upcoming, we have three, uh, um, four upcoming calls in addition to our call today and the one we had last week with Ambassador Dermer. On Wednesday, July 1, Anat Wilf will be joining us for a conversation about her new book, The War of Return, How Western Indulgence Has Obstructed the Path to Peace a very important subject for rabbis to uh, study and to speak and to hear what she has to say. Then on Monday, July 6th, Buzi Herzog, the head of the Jewish Agency, former head of the opposition, will be speaking to us from Israel about the condition of the world and Jewish community and the role rabbis can play in continuing to prepare for the future. David Makovsky with the Washington Institute will be with us on Wednesday, July 15. By that time, uh, it's, it's assumed that Israel's uh, plans for uh, the West Bank will be revealed and David will be giving his insights and perspectives on that. And then that will be followed by July 22, just a week before Danny Dayan returns to Israel. Danny has been the ambassador, consul general in New York, uh, often referred to as the position which is the ambassador to the Jews, to the American Jewish community. All are designed to fulfill our mission of promoting unity and dialogue between North American rabbis and Israel. And so with that now, let me take this opportunity to thank all of you for joining us and especially to thank Ambassador Dory Gold for being with us. Ambassador Gold is president of the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs and he has served in the United States or as Israel's ambassador to the United Nations from 1997 through 1999. Also, as Director General of Israel's Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 2015 to 2016. And in that capacity, he was instrumental in expanding Israel's ties in Africa, the Arab world, and the Far East. He has served as a senior advisor to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and as an envoy to the Palestinian Authority, to Egypt, Jordan, and the Gulf, Gulf states. He holds a, P, a BA, MA, and a PhD, all from Columbia University. But most important of all, it is a proud graduate of Camp Rama pro summer programs. He's written extensively about the Middle East. He's had several books which have been published on many articles. And the reason why I, we invited him to speak to us today is because he's played a major role in helping the United States government understand Israel's position to help uh, the efforts to formulate the approach of the United States government to Israel and so uh, with that, it's my pleasure to invite Ambassador Gold to speak to uh, us on our call today, sponsored by the Zionist Rabbinic Coalition. And let me begin, first of all, by just saying it's great to see you, wishing you a refuah shlema. Yesterday, Ambassador Gold had some minor eye surgery, although no surgery is really minor, and uh, that's why the call was postponed today. And we very much appreciate your being with us. Ambassador Gold is going to speak, first of all, about the plan um, is it annexation? Is it extension of sovereignty? What's the difference and why now? And then after addressing these issues, um, we'll be open for questions. You can send your questions in the chat box and I'll be consolidating them and then trying to present them uh, to Ambassador Gold after his presentation. So, Baruch Haba. Baruch Haba. Baruch Haba. Um, we've been talking about the uh, American plan as well as the discussion that's occurring about whether Israel retains parts of the West Bank uh, unilaterally. Um, I have been uh, waging a small campaign of my own against the term annexation, which is used in the Israeli press when they talk about sipuach, that's the Hebrew term, um, because frankly, uh, annexation is a word that contains in it some kind of um, a disapproval, some kind of implication of a crime or a war crime. And um, 
it's, that is not the case. I, I ran into this sort of what's called revisionist thinking that led to my own thinking because um, I used to keep texts from uh, previous ambassadors to the United Nations. Um, back in 67, the ambassador of the UN was Abba Iban. He was also foreign minister. And um, he wrote letters like everybody else does to the secretary general when he thought the secretary general was being unfair. And apparently um, at the time we were um, extending Israeli sovereignty into the area of East Jerusalem. And the ambassador of Pakistan wrote a letter to the secretary general, which was distributed across the UN, uh, describing it as annexation. And Iban said that is not the right term. And uh, he didn't really explain himself, but you could see that Israel already in 67 had fundamental problems with the terminology of annexation. So um, today, I think now the government of Israel is much more careful about terminology and is trying to say different things. Um, but And yet, by the way, if I may interrupt, that is the operative term that so many people are using. You're right. That is the operative term that people are using. And it is problematic. And it is problematic. Um, to give you an example, um, the International Committee of the Red Cross, which deals with violations of international law, interpreting them, it uh, deals with the Fourth Geneva Convention. It defines annexation as, quote, a unilateral act of a state through which it proclaims its sovereignty over the territory of another state, unquote. So if you think of that's the solid definition of the International Committee of the Red Cross, then I think for a minute, well, wait a minute, who had sovereignty over the West Bank um, prior to 1967? It wasn't Jordan, although people who don't really know very much might say it was Jordan. And, um, you know, that's just one point of how uh, annexation, you know, let's take, for example, uh, the annexation of Northern Cyprus by the Turks after the invasion of Cyprus in 1975. Then, of course, Northern Cyprus becomes a separate state. But that's a real case of moving into some other territory, some other country, and taking that land. That wasn't our case. You know, we're now commemorating the 100th anniversary this year of the um, San Remo understandings from 1922. Now, again, I don't want to bog people down in Zionist history that may seem a little bit uh, far off, but it isn't. And what did San Remo do? San Remo was the meeting of the victorious powers of World War I, who designated what happens to various territories that particularly were part of the Ottoman Empire, now that the Ottoman Empire was disbanding itself. And um, it was at San Remo that the victorious powers, France, Britain, and others declared that the area that was to become the British Mandate of Palestine was to become a Jewish national home. The historic rights of the Jewish people were recognized. So can you annex your own country? Can you annex territory uh, that is recognized as being territory which you are entitled to? So it's, it's a little bit not so simple as people sometimes make it out to be. Um, and should we be talking about this? Basically, claims about the Arab-Israel conflict, claims to territory, claims to land, claims to rights, have usually been enunciated 
in the context of past Arab-Israeli wars. You know, Israel captured the territory in a war of self-defense. Um, the claims of the Arab states in the Golan Heights and in Sinai were in the context of a war. Uh, nobody has rolled the, uh, uh, the history, um, has rolled back the history to 19, uh, 1920. But, you know, that's part of it. And what has happened is as a result of the fact that we haven't looked back at our fundamental history and our fundamental legal rights, our narrative, the narrative that people when the uh, Zionist movement was founded, that narrative has been forgotten. And the narrative that is being enunciated instead is a Palestinian narrative. And that's one of the reasons why we have been losing that battle. We're very good at talking about, wait a minute, you know, our tanks came under fire first in 1967. But talking about fundamental rights, we've been really bad been bad at that. And I think it's important to underline that if this year, because of it's the anniversary of San Remo, San Remo is the city in Italy where that conference took place, and um, uh, incorporating that into our discussion about Israel's rights. So when we talk about Israel retaining parts of the West Bank, well, that was what was thought of by you know, the um, government of Israel back in 67, retaining the Jordan Valley as the buffer that would protect Israel, but not retaining everything, not keeping everything. Even the Trump plan talks about Israel retaining 30% of the West Bank and the um, Palestinians getting 70% of the West Bank. So that's closer in line to what was thought of back in 1967. So uh, I don't want to belabor you with uh, all this uh, Israeli history, but it's important to understand the relative merits of the arguments that are being made today uh, behind the scenes. But if you could just share that with us, because I think many of the rabbis on the call um, are hearing uh, the things that, that, that we are hearing in the press, and there's great concern. Let me try and cut to the chase of some of the issues, one of which is, as you well know, it was, uh, some of Israel's best friends and strongest supporters in Congress, uh, people who were strong opponents of the uh, uh, Iran uh, uh, deal and other times when they've really gone to bat with Israel, are raising red flags about this. Uh, we're talking about Senator Schumer, Cardin Menendez, uh, uh, Congressman Hoyer and Deutsch and others within, you know, great concern within the progressive wing or, or even within the Democratic Party itself. Um, uh, and so how, what, how, how do you address that? How do, how do we, you know, help our congregants understand this? How do we help them understand it? If uh, when, when, when such strong support, traditionally strong supporters of Israel are raising questions, why don't they understand what you've just said about the San Remo conference and how binding is San Remo in fact? Well, first of all, the legacy of San Remo didn't die in old textbooks that are put on dusty shelves uh, at the Columbia Library or whatever. Um, there is a um, important, uh, this is a little bit, it's not as ancient, but it's, it's in incredibly important. When the United Nations Charter was drafted in 1945, it included a clause called Article 80. Article 80 of the UN Charter said, everything in terms of international rights that existed from the past, meaning from the League of Nations, carries over into the new world of the United Nations. Now, you know what that clause was called among the professionals who were drafting this material in 1945? It was called the Palestine Clause. Oh. It was called the Palestine Clause because the Jews were particularly cognizant of its significance for protecting their long-term interests, their history. Uh, why aren't people aware of it today? Because I think 
over the last 20, 30 years or so, we've become engaged in immediate problems. Did Israel commit war crimes in the Gaza Strip? So you talk about that. You don't go back at all. And because of, I think, a great deal of ignorance, and it's nobody's fault, it's just the way, you know, the um, um, history of knowledge gets preserved and developed. Okay, what I want to focus on, how does this, um, first, I'm, I'm not sure we actually even have heard from you yet exactly what it is that Israel is, is thinking of doing, and of course it could change between now and then, but what is it that's going to be done, uh, is your understanding, under the Trump peace plan and, and Israel's understanding of it? And number two, how does that advance Israel? How does it help Israel, especially in light of the fact that it's already having such a detrimental impact in terms of so many friends of Israel speaking out against it? By the way, this isn't the first time this happened. And this is something that uh, I think is important to stress. Remember, after the 67 Six Day War, Israel extended its sovereignty to the eastern part of Jerusalem. That happened. Now, um, I think when people spoke about it back then, it was in a context of who is going to protect the holy sites of the three great faiths. Will it be Jordan? Who's going to do it? Jordan had desecrated those holy sites. So even though it became sort of um, common to look back at the days of King Hussein with some kind of uh, sentimentality, um, it was decided among Levi Eshkol, Moshe Dayan, and the uh, top leadership of the Israeli labor government at the time, that the only one who's gonna protect the holy sites of mankind will be Israel and Israel extended its um, jurisdiction to those areas. So this is, a, this is just yet another time where that's happened. Of course, it was the Golan Heights. And I don't want to get into all of this. Right. But this seems to be very different, uh, uh, Ambassador Gold. How do you see it being different? See it, it being different in the context of, uh, uh, because of the fact that it, it may have implications for relations with the Palestinians and the possibility of some future two-state solution, um, and also at a time when Israel is making inroads with the Arab world, many of which you are responsible for, and, and certainly Prime Minister Netanyahu um, is responsible for, and whether or not that may um, uh, uh, rock the, the cart on some of those uh, uh, positive developments that are happening. Well, again, uh, a classic thing that Israeli diplomats always used to do is play the blame game. You know, oh, you know why we don't have peace? You know why it hasn't progressed? Well, let me tell you what Abu Mazen said on the 13th of July, you know, uh, thir three years ago. So I, I have to play a little bit of the blame game. And, I, you know, one of the things I've done personally, whether, whether I'm in government or out of government, I've had meetings with both uh, Arabs from the Gulf and with Palestinians. Most of those meetings took place in Rome, Rome, Italy. And um, you know, I remember discussing what had happened in 2014. You know, there had been a, um, a secret channel for uh, Israelis and Palestinians, and official representative of Israel and official representatives of the Palestinians to lay out a peace plan. And uh, at a certain point, Secretary Kerry took the results of that peace plan and brought them to President Obama. Now, the peace plan was designed at the time uh, in a very unique way. Uh, it contained reservations that you could incorporate. So you could say, yes, I accept the Kerry peace plan, but I have problems with Clause 7, Clause 11, and Clause 14. You could say that. And it was an interesting mechanism for making a very tough peace process work. 
So they all go to the Oval Office and they ask, and President Obama asks, Mahmoud Abbas asks Abu Mazen, so do you accept the plan? What do you have reservations over? And in famous few words, Abu Mazen said, I'll get back to you. And he never got back to him. He still hasn't gotten back to him. So I tell you that because basically the hope and progress towards some kind of peace breakthrough has been frozen. And therefore something new, something different was required. And that brings us to the uh, Trump plan, which basically built on the mistakes and built on the lessons, more than mistakes, the lessons of that last diplomatic effort in 2014. Um, Okay, so in, in, let me ask you this then, in terms of the uh, uh, lessons that it's building upon, how is this uh, uh, different then from, you know, what had happened before? And how do you hope that this may, it sounds to me as if, you know, it's a little bit of an attempt to be a game changer, to break a log jam, to try and mix it up a little bit in the hope that then something will happen. And, and I recognize, obviously, as all the rabbis do on the call here, probably, in terms of the recalcitrance, the obstructionism, uh, and, and obsequiousness of the, of the Palestinians and their constant uh, 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 saying no to it. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so, so how might this change the dynamics a little bit? Well, in terms of also Israel's interests, I have to say, if somebody says, you know, I have a plan for the West Bank and we're gonna have to move out most of the settlers. How many settlers are there now? You're gonna move a half a million settlers out of the West Bank? That's a realistic peace plan? No, it isn't really real. So you say, well, why did they go there? You can get into the historical de debate and discussion uh, in parallel. But I think the main thing is that if somebody wants to put forward a realistic peace plan, it better not be with moving people. When I was involved in the drafting of this process, one of the things we all recognized was we need a process that keeps at least over 90% of Israelis in the West Bank and 90% of Palestinians in the West Bank in their homes. You don't move them. Um, another element of the past. People said, you know what we'll do? We're going to bring international peacekeepers into the West Bank. We'll put them in the Jordan Valley. So if we did a poll of Israelis and we asked them, do you trust international peacekeepers? Do you want Swedish forces defending the state of Israel? You know, you don't have to be um, an Israeli pollster to figure out that most Israelis would be against that. So one of the positive things in the current plan being discussed is that Israelis will defend themselves by themselves. So um, this is not an easy process, but there is an attempt to be somewhat creative in coming up with ideas that might have a chance of working. Now, the aspect of it being a, a unilateral uh, move on Israel's part, there have been unilateral moves in the, in the past. Some worked, some didn't work, some, and so on. Um, and and so can you talk a little bit about that in terms of, you know, uh, that's also one of the reasons why there's some criticism of what's being done. Unilateral, I'll, I'll even go out on a limb is rightly questioned. If one side makes off like a bandit and the other side is empty handed. But if you look at the percentages of West Bank territory that are supposed to be divided, and I actually would prefer to talk about this as a territorial compromise, because that's what it is. It's really a territorial compromise. Well, in that compromise, 70% of the West Bank goes to the Palestinians, and 30% goes to Israel. So you call unilateral because Israel's calling the shots 
and saying, yeah, we want this. And the Palestinians are sitting in Ramallah, you know, not very happy. But, hey, the percentages are in their favor. And in this case, that's how it should be, in this case. Is there any, uh, are there any conversations you've had which would give calls for hope for uh, that kind of recognition and realization uh, with either people in any of the Gulf states, uh, officials there, and or in pa the Palestinian uh, territories or anything like that? My impression, and I may be wrong, is that the Gulf states don't really care very much about this. We've heard that, yeah. And yet and they may feel obligated, though, to make a public fuss. They may be going to help. They may be obligated because of the po possible public reactions that their adversaries can drum up, like the Muslim Brotherhood. But um, frankly, this is not the night. This is not 1967 or 1973, where the Arab publics were really, you know, out in the streets uh, for the Palestinians. It's not that a lot like that now. Right. So let me ask you this. Um, so far, we've been talking about it, but I, I must tell you, um, uh, I, I, and I'm someone who wants to be supportive of this. Uh, what can you tell me to convince me that this, in fact, is a, uh, a, a good plan and that it's going to be uh, in the long run in the best interest for Israel and it's going to be in the best interest of uh, the Middle East? That uh, uh, what, what is it about it that's going to uh, uh, be guaranteeing and, and uh, or not even not so guarantee, but, but moving the ball forward in whatever way that may mean. Well, and, and, and it's helpful to talk sometimes in sound bites, so to speak. Okay, I won't give you long lectures. <laughs> First of all, what if we don't do anything? What if we just let the status quo stand? Because it's us doing something that's being discussed here. And I would have to say the following. Over the last number of years, the Palestinians have been active unilaterally with respect to the land dispute in the West Bank. And, um, you know, it started with um, Salam Fayyad but he's actually a guy you can talk to. There are many Palestinians who are in the land business who have been moving into area C. I remember the West Bank was divided into area A, which is small, area B, which is a little larger than area C. And they've been moving into area C and trying to take it over. Area C was designated by Yitzhak Rabin as an area that Israel is going to have to retain so when we see Area C slipping through our fingers, you know, we have to be very, very concerned. Now, Area C contains um, important strategic positions, such as um, early warning stations, such as the roads that connect key parts of the West Bank. You know, if you want to drive from Jerusalem to Malay Adumim and then down to the Dead Sea, that road, road number one, goes right through Area C. If Area C is taken over unilaterally by hostile Palestinian elements, we've got a big problem. So, um, one of the things you can say that this initiative does is it preempts that by saying, you see this area? This area will be retained by Israel and not just sitting on our hands and hoping for the best. So understanding what you're saying of, 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 of breaking a log jam, trying to create and realize it, and what you're talking about right now, um, are there some areas in Palestinian uh, territories that are going to be uh, not contiguous, that there uh, may be underground tunnels that are necessary uh, to connect areas or things like that? And if so, how does all of that uh, work out to the best of your knowledge? Well, look, you have the case of the Gaza Strip right, on the one hand, and the rest of the West Bank on the other hand. Now, what are you going to do with that? Now, most people who have been involved in this process recognize 
that you're going to have to build tunnels or um, overland bridges or something so that the different parts of what might emerge as a Palestinian territory can be connected. Mm -hmm. So that, that the plan calls for some of that. What about um, the, as I understand it, the current plan is talking about extending sovereignty, Israeli law, to the uh, uh, Jews who are living in the, the settlements, which is 30% 30, 30 of the West Bank area. Um, how, how much of the Jewish population is that impacted? What happens to the Palestinians who are either living in that area and or who are not in that area? Do they maintain their own sovereignty or how does that work? Uh, I think what we're talking about are area, areas where Jews are living are areas that will come under Israeli sovereignty. Areas where Palestinians are living will come under Palestinian sovereignty. And you're gonna to need to work out a road system that allows people to stay connected. Look, it's not easy. I remember when um, somebody was working on the maps and he looked at the map and he said, that is an ugly map. <laughs> and I said, that is a map that reflects the reality of the situation. And it's our best shot at making that reality work. If you don't want to pull people out of their homes and bust them off to another part of the territory, which nobody wants to do, then you're going to have to have a map which has problematic aspects to it. And that is what we have here. Okay, so when we're, you know, again, as we're listening to, to the aspects of what you're uh, explaining, um, it certainly seems reasonable. But again, I come back to the point where there are so many people for uh, whom it is not reasonable. And who, wh wh why is it that the, some of the Democrats that I mentioned before, uh, rabbis as well and others, are reacting so very uh, negatively, uh, even though, by the way, it hasn't fully been, been revealed yet what Israel will do, um, and so on. But how do you understand? What is the reason for that? And uh, uh, that, that why, why do you think there's so much, um, I don't know, is it misinformation? Is it projection? Is it misunderstanding? Um, is it Israel, uh, once again, not doing a good job with its PR, um, et cetera, et cetera? Well, I think you also have a very emotional diplomatic process, which is overlaid with a very emotional political battle in both countries. In other words, labor versus we could in Israel, Democrats versus Republicans here. And, um, you know, we're aware of that. We're conscious of that. Perhaps the polarization in America is even greater than the polarization in Israel. And that leads people to judge things on other considerations and not just um, the merits of the case. So let me ask you this, based on what you just said here a moment ago. Is this uh, uh, basically ref uh, reflect a broad-based consensus of the Israeli public, or is it something coming out of just one political uh, wing within Israel, so to speak? Well, as a student of uh, the positions of Yitzhak Rabin, and I remind you that it was Rabin's government that signed the Oslo agreements with Yasser Arafat, I think the map, the maps that are there in the plan reflect Rabin's thinking more than any other map in recent history. The only thing that I don't particularly care for, but it's there, is the requirement that whatever we get from the Palestinians in the West Bank, we have to pay for with Israeli sovereign territory. What does that mean, pay for? That means, you know, if we're getting 30% of the West Bank, we've got to find an equivalent amount of territory in sovereign Israel and give it to the Palestinians. So you've seen, if you look at the maps, these blobs of territory in the um, Western Negev that we have to give up and give them to the Palestinians. I think that isn't a great idea, but 
if you want to retain the Jordan Valley, that's what you're going to have to do. And the Jordan Valley is a very important part of Israel's national security. Could you speak to, to us a little bit about that? Um, you and I spoke earlier about the significance. How does this plan uh, improve or, or, or deal with the aspect of the secure, Israel's very real security needs? Well, remember, we have peace with Egypt. And I don't think we need a big, complicated structure of, of security zones to protect us from the Egyptian army. We're working with the Egyptian army today. You know, most people don't even know this, but uh, in the Sinai, in the uh, northern Sinai, there is an area which has been taken over by uh, what I would call Egyptian ISIS, uh, Islamic State. They're very dangerous. And um, we work with Egypt in countering them, the Israeli army and the Egyptian army. So that's okay. So where is the threat to Israel going to come from? It's going to come from our east. When I say from our east and our north, uh, I'm speaking about um, the Shiite militias that are operating today in Iraq, where there's a Shiite population of considerable size, and from Syria, where the Alawites have uh, begun to define themselves as a division of the Shiite world over the last 10 or 15 years. So these, both of these have been armed by Iran and have been struggling to get to the Israeli border one way or the other and open a new front. And therefore, I believe it is critically important for us to uh, have a defensible border to our east. And that brings us to focus on the um, Jordan Valley, which was first picked out by the great Israeli strategist Yigal Alon and by his pupil, whose name was Yitzhak Rabin. We can talk about it in greater detail, but that's the- sure. so, it, so, so with that aspect of the security and the reference to the Oslo Accords, if I'm not mistaken, one of the rabbis wrote a question and I'm trying to share with, some, with you some of the questions that are coming in. And that is that uh, the Oslo Accords, uh, we touched upon this pre earlier, but let me put it in this context, prohibits unilateral um, action. And so is this not a violation? And then or if it, if it uh, if, if so, then, you know, how is Israel able to stand on ground to protest Palestinian unilateral uh, actions as well? Palestinian unilateral actions have been going on for decades now. Maybe you remember this little village called Khan al Ahmar. It is a Palestinian village, Bedouin village, built on the highway from Malay Adumim down to uh, the Dead Sea. And this is a road the military uses, a lot of Israeli civilians use. Mm -hmm. And what's the big deal if the Palestinians build illegal houses and illegal structures in Khan al Ahmar in the desert, in the Judean desert? Well, the big deal is that if there's ever escalation, this is the first place where snipers are going to go to sit on the roof of those houses and shoot at Israeli vehicles. And we've been there. We've had that in the Second Intifada. So they, again, Khan al Ahmar didn't exist at the time. There were other places like uh, Ayosh Junction. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't remember what your question was. I'm talking about the unilateral aspect of the actions that, the, and, and, and Israel's standing as a result of that. Well, you could stand uh, you know, in front of the White House for 10 years and say, I want to reach an agreement with, yeah, with uh, Mahmoud Abbas. And it's just not going to happen. It didn't happen recently, and it's not going to happen now. And if all of a sudden he changes direction or his successor changes direction, 
you can try and work something out. Is that the four year part, a window that, that talk to us a little bit about that? Well, there is a four year window, which was created in the uh, Trump plan um, uh, to see whether the Palestinians will come through in that four year window and begin a serious negotiation. And? And if they don't, then Israeli unilateralism will be encouraged. Israeli so, unilateralism, by the way, was thought to be a way of getting the Palestinians back to the negotiating table. Right. So to the extent that the, you have the year of the prime minister, would it be helpful in, in when Israel announces whatever it's going to announce uh, to be sure to uh, do the kind of thing that Golda Meir always used to do that was so good, which was to you know, say, we're doing this, but you know, we are uh, hoping the Palestinians will come to the table and that they will, in fact, uh, pick up the gauntlet. Now, we had, of course, the 10-month settlement freeze during the Obama administration that Netanyahu uh, put in, but Israel barely got a, 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 a footnote of, of credit for that. Um, yeah. And so, you know, what, what I, I guess part of it is, is to, you know, be more aggressive, both in terms of how it's packaged, how it's presented, and to try and garner greater support um, within the uh, public for that. Of course, the problem is that we've been at this process for, as I said before, maybe a decade and a half. 1993, we started the Oslo peace process. And we have Palestinian refusal on, off, on, off, mostly off. And it, it's very hard to rev up support and use these, these phrases that could win us a, an award, uh, you know, from, um, you know, uh, some uh, peace organization. Um, but the prime minister has been trying to make the peace process work make a defective process work and it hasn't been working right and so but within that context let's go back again to uh, some of the points we've touched upon uh, which still need to be focused on it and, and addressed and that is um israel has always enjoyed such bipartisan support in the united states and one of the questions or one of the concerns is whether or not this will shake that up number two it is called the trump plan um and unfortunately because of the uh, nature of the american both American politics, as well as, to be honest, you know, the nature of the way in which Mr. Trump himself presents himself and his positions, many times something which he has done, does will, even if it is positive, people will just automatically feel a, a visceral need to uh, oppose. Um, if he doesn't uh, win re-election and Biden uh, and, and, and the next president is a Democratic president and it, his name happens to be Joe Biden, um, and there uh, are leaders in the Senate and the Congress who are from the Democratic Party and so on. Um, how is Israel prepared to work with them to address the, their concerns to make sure uh, that it, uh, 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 um, that Israel will continue to enjoy a bipartisan support when so many people in one party in particular have spoken out against it already? This is gonna take an effort by both Israelis and American Jews. And rabbis. When I say American Jews, sure, they, sure, no, but yeah, that's but, why we're talking to you. We want to hear what's that, what's the message for us to be able to share. Look, I'm going to tell you something, and maybe my saying this isn't so smart, but it's something I, I want you you to know. I have always advocated bipartisanship in Israel's approach to uh, American politics. And I've got dozens of stories. I'm not going to belabor the, 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 your, your listeners right now with them. But I noticed one of the major American Jewish organizations um, just a few years back started taking me and putting me only in Republican circles and didn't ask me to address Democrats. And I was pissed off because we're supposed to have bipartisanship. And that shouldn't have been done. So what I'm asking you is that when you turn to your organizations, when you turn to um, rabbis, make sure you get people from both parties in Israel and not just one side. Because then you're making a mistake. Then, then the, 
the two, the, let's say the Democrats and the um, Israeli progressives will just disappear in their own little box and they won't unify the Jewish people, which is what we need right now. Absolutely. Um, and so within this context, uh, what uh, is it that you're prepared to share with us about what we can anticipate to hear when the announcement is made uh, of, of what will be happening? From I do, perspective? Frankly, although I've been on the inside, I do not know. I don't know whether it'll be a smaller unilateral act, a larger unilateral act. I can't tell you. Okay. And then are you... Uh, uh, um, going to be engaged in any advocacy in, uh, for, for this. So uh, w once it happens. Again, I don't know. I have to see what it is. Okay. Um, going back to the aspect of what we talked about just a moment ago in terms of the message to the American Jewish community and the message for rabbis. We have uh, rabbis on the call, some of whom are uh, already uh, inclined to be in favor of this, some of them are on the fence, some of them perhaps even, you know, not necessarily uh, supportive of this concept at this time. Um, I want to try and understand uh, uh, what is it about the plan um, that it, it, it help us to understand why it enjoys such broad-based consensus support. I mean, think some people were hoping, well, maybe Gantz will come in, uh, those who opposed it, and, and, and hoping, well, maybe Gantz will save the day, and others realize it's not necessarily realistic that he is supportive of it. David, I saw something Yair Lapid said, he basically is relatively supportive of it, and he's the head of the opposition. Um, so, you know, uh, again, what do Israelis know that we don't know? I'm missing your question. It got a little long. Okay. In turn, what I'm trying to uh, understand is what is it about the plan uh, that uh, uh, makes it so that it, it, it is enjoying such broad consensus in Israel that even though there are risks involved, there's a feeling that this is what we should do? Look, um, one of the things I run the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, jcpa.org. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we've done, I would say, since 2005, so we've been running polls, public opinion polls. And we're always looking at, well, do you support retaining uh, the old city of Jerusalem? Do you support retaining something else? And certain territories in the West Bank are as popular as Jerusalem itself. One of those territories is the Jordan Valley. So that is why a peace plan that is based on Israel retaining such important strategic territory uh, is so popular is because that's the position of the people of Israel. Great. Well, I want to um, begin to uh, bring our call and our conversation to a close. Um, you certainly have, have uh, enlightened us about a lot of different aspects of this. And I hope that uh, through the questions I was able to present from the, came to me from colleagues and from others uh, on, on this call, um, that uh, we, we come away with a, a better understanding of what Israel is hoping to do. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, we can only hope that it will have uh, uh, the positive impact. Um, and uh, before we, we go, and I, I just wanna give you a chance, uh, uh, Ambassador Gold, um, if there are any final messages or words that you would like to share with us um, at this time on this very, very important issue, which unfortunately um, has been politicized and is, is a divisive one. Um, and again, the purpose of the Zionist Rabbinic uh, Coalition is to try and find ways to build those bridges to help uh, the American Jewish public in particular understand Israel's position. And so anything you can say as we wrap up our call that would be helpful in that regard would be greatly appreciated. Understand our history. And when I say that, I'm specifically referring to, you know, um, as I said before, who was the one who was the biggest advocate of Israel staying in the Jordan Valley? Well, I could say you got a loan, but it was really Yitzhak Rabin. Rabin gave a final speech in the Knesset uh, one month before he was assassinated. And his final speech, it's very eerie to read this speech. You can find it on Google. I've read it, yeah. And what it says, among other things, is that Israel should retain the Jordan Valley in the widest sense of that term. That means not just the water's edge, 
but the um, the um, western slopes of the hill ridge. It's it's very prominent. Now, why is that important to know, and why is that important to learn? Because if you have an Israeli government that is seeking to retain Rabin's map, that those positions should receive broad support. They get broad support in Israel. They should get broad support in America. And it shouldn't be dependent on who's president. It shouldn't be dependent on, um, on American politics or in Israeli politics. I think if we uh, can build a consensus, we can fight the polarization that has come into both our communities. And that's something we must do. Thank you. Again, let me thank all of the rabbis who are participating in the call, as well as uh, Ambassador Gold for being with us today. Um, we're going to continue the conversation <clears throat> next Wednesday at 2 with Anat Wilf, who will be talking about an extension of this in certain respects uh, with her book, The War of Return. Very, very important conversation. And then with Buji Herzog on Monday, July 6th, um, uh, who uh, will be uh, talking about broader issues, not necessarily just focused on the thick matters of uh, 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 the, the matters of the day, but then we come back to that with David Makovsky on July 15th with, for his analysis of uh, what's going on. And then finally, uh, with Danny Dayan, with his retrospective of having served as the ambassador to the American Jewish community, so to speak, informally for the last four years, having come here as a leader of the settler movement, um, does he, how does he return to Israel? That's going to be a fascinating conversation as well. So please, incidentally, also go to our website, designersrabbis.org. Where there are, where there's an article by Ambassador Gold, um, as or if it's not up yet, it will be up shortly, as well as some other excellent articles um, to help to uh, elucid, elucidate uh, uh, information about this uh, uh, very, very important issue that is of great interest to all of us. And so, for that, we thank you all for joining us. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Gold, as well.